I grew up in a small town called China Grove, North Carolina. Not the China Grove that the Doobie Brothers sang about. It was named for the Chinaberry tree, and there were groves of them. So they named the place China Grove. And we both attended the same church in a little town called Landis, which was a couple of miles from China Grove. And these were our Sunday school classes when we were kids. I used to sit on the back row on Wednesday night with all my high school friends, and I don't know what went on up there, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the windows are the same. Yes, they are. <laughs> Mom and Dad were both solid Christians when I was born. So we went to church as a regular thing, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. So we were a churched family. The sanctuary was packed. They had chairs. They had, you had put chairs down the aisles. The balcony was packed. You could feel the, the movement. You could feel the spirit. You could feel the fellowship. It was just, everything was in harmony. It was just amazing to have, to be a part of that. Uh, yep, we were married right here. Well. Be 60. Yes. 60 years. Yes. Sir. She's only 49. No, I'm 48. Oh, you're 48. Yes. Excuse me. <laughs> and right over here is where I was sitting the night I became a Christian. And when the service was over, I was so moved, I ran to the front. <laughs> and the practice was when people came forward to accept Christ, several people would just bow around them on their knees and pray with them. Uh, but that's where it all started. <laughs> I was eight years old when I accepted Christ and the emphasis was the Word of God. And I was all the way in as far as Jesus was concerned. But um, as far as the church was concerned, they had other notions about what I should have been doing, the legalistic thing, and I just didn't fit the mold. But uh, I'm very grateful for those years because it kept me on, it kept me on track in the Word, and that's the key. That's the key. Oh my goodness. I think these looked like they were the same lockers. <laughs> Might these have been the original lockers? I think so. <laughs> that's, what I, so. that's what I thought as I, I looked at so. them. <laughs> um, was the auditorium here? It's pretty impressive. Yeah, that is so pretty. The most important one is the one on the bottom. Like cheer wine. Cheer wine. When I'm speaking, often I will say, in talking about love, I say, you know, love has a thousand definitions. I said, for example, people say, I love the mountains. I love the beach. I love my dog. And in North Carolina, we say, I love barbecue. <laughs> and I say, North Carolina, that's always pork barbecue, okay? <laughs> I usually suggest the barbecue plate because it's got your barbecue, your slaw. We have red and white slaw. Locals, they love the red slaw with their barbecue. And then the more northern, you know, they look at me cross-eyed. Barbecue is a noun or a verb. Uh, now you go out west, you go to a bar. I went to a barbecue out there one time and they were cooking hamburgers and hot dogs, but they were grilling it and they call it a barbecue. Yeah. In North Carolina, when you say barbecue, it's a noun and it's pork cooked up and chopped or pulled and usually got the vinegar sauce and all on it. Well, I like everything on the menu, but uh, that hot dog's hard to beat. <laughs> You're right. Uh, we are pretty famous for our hot dogs. People come in here and uh, what makes me feel good, people say, I was in here 25 years and got that hot dog and said, I want another one. And then they, when they get through, they'll say, it tastes just like I remember. Well, that's what my mother always ordered. So every time I come back, I order that in her memory. 
That's, <laughs> that's great. That's great. So everybody's got a little bit of mud, a little dirt in their life, don't matter who it is. But now, Gary's pretty much gun barrel straight most of the time. Sandra says the only time she ever saw her brother get a whipping was when he, on a Halloween night, he let the air out of one of the neighbor's tires. It was Halloween, and the lady didn't give us a trick, a treat, you know? So what are you gonna do? You gotta trick her. So we just let the air out of her tires. I guess that's to the extent of his mischievousness, but anyway, he did get a whipping. <laughs> I always feel more relaxed when I'm in the mountains. Yeah, all the mountains are yeah. incredible as far as yeah. a, that feeling of a quietness in your life. I don't know, it's, they're just so majestic and almost overpowering, but it's more than relaxing. It's overwhelming with the, the quietness and the, the reality of who God is and who you are, <laughs> you know. In the early years of our marriage, we had uh, lots of conflicts. Well, in the first two years of our marriage. <laughs> Not too, it didn't last really a long time, but it was pretty bad. Two years is a long time, okay. <laughs> the big thing in marriage is, is, you know, we expect things to be, we expect the person to be, we expect and our expectations uh, are often, often unrealistic, but often for that person, it just doesn't work. I mean, my attitude was, I know how to have a good marriage. If you'll just listen to me, we'll have one. <laughs> and she wouldn't listen to me. I, I said, there's no way. I'm saying, I'm talking to God. There's no way I can get up and preach hope to people and be this miserable at home. And I don't know what else to do. And as soon as I said that, there came to my mind a visual image of Jesus on his knees washing the feet of his disciples. And I heard God say to me, that's the problem in your marriage. You do not have the attitude of Christ toward your wife. The Love Languages was the third book that I wrote. I knew it helped people. And I thought if I could put this concept in a book and write it in the language of a common person so everyone can understand it, make it simple, maybe I could help a lot of couples. I would never have time to see in my office. So that's what really motivated me to write that book. How do you help your adult child when he or she is having marital problems? Let me make four suggestions. Number one, take the problem seriously. Problems don't simply go away with time. They usually get worse. I knew that Christians would know every one of those love languages is in the Bible over and over and over again. So I knew Christians would get that connection. So I really wrote it for non-Christians. And I've had many people say, you know, I didn't know that was a Christian book till I got to the end. <laughs> and that's where I share, people have asked me in many of our conferences, okay, you've given us information, but how do we get the motivation to, to do this? And I said, well, I can tell you where I got my motivation and I share my relationship with Christ, you know, and the love of God is poured out into us, you know, and then we share it. Uh, I said, but you know, that, that's my experience. God is sovereign in the way he uses things. And people have said to me, how do I account for all of this? And I say, the short answer is God and the long answer is God. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, or stands in the way of sinners, or sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates both day and night, and he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth his fruit in his season. So about 500 people when I first came in 1971. So I heard 
that it used to be there was no real lobby. And so when people would would come, that Dr. Quartz would preach a long time. And so <laughs> you'd have literally dozens and dozens of people out on the country club side. Well, the country club side was a wide sidewalk, yeah. and it was filled with people all the way to country club. And yeah. then on this side of the parking lot, it was filled with people standing waiting to get in for the second service. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder how many of them are like, yeah, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> they came back. It's going to uh, be a while for Dr. lunch today. Dr. Corsa was not known for brevity. No, no, no. Uh, but we look back with a lot of gratitude on his ministry here. You know, when I think of Gary, you know, I think of someone who has just walked so faithfully with these people for so long, not just as the one who stands up publicly and proclaims the, the word, but the one who's intimately involved in their lives. I think our church probably doesn't even grasp how large, you know, the, the love language brand is outside of the walls, you know, of Calvary Baptist Church. And yet what you see in Gary is you would never know you know, that it's, you know, sold this many millions of copies and that there's all these incredible opportunities for influence outside of the church. The state motto of North Carolina translated means to be rather than to seem. Don't try to be uh, something that you're not. I think that that is, is what characterizes Gary. He's, he's just who he is. His ability to reach out across the barriers of culture and get to the heart of the universal language of love is really uh, empowered by that ability to be genuine and transparent and real. He doesn't know he's old and he doesn't know he's famous. <laughs> So don't tell him. <laughs> and maybe he'll stay humble. <laughs> well, you know, I recognized a long time ago, and it's one of the biggest lessons I learned, it was right after I graduated from college, is that without God, I can do nothing. And when you realize that, there's not much room for pride. Whatever happens to us is not just because we did something great and marvelous and wonderful. It's because God enabled us to do whatever it is we do. And He takes our lives and uses it for His glory. No matter where your beginnings are, if you surrender your life to God, He will use you the way He wants to. And I think God can grow us best when we do what Gary said, I'm here, Lord. Use me however you see fit. I'll go wherever, I'll do whatever. I'm just here for you. But I think as I look back on my time here at Calvary, the most significant thing is the people. To have been a part of watching God work in this place and bring literally thousands of people through the years to know Christ, first of all, as Savior, and then to commit their lives to ministry and service in this family. I just believe that, uh, you know, great things are going to happen in the future. And I think Will and our present staff, uh, you know, God is going to use them in the future. And I'm going to do everything I can to help them. I'm going to pray for them, encourage them, and do everything I can to help them because I believe that God has great plans for Calvary in the future. When I think of a life well lived and what I see, you know, in Gary and Carolyn and what I love so much is that here we have two people who have walked with Jesus for a long time, who can stand at the end of their lives and the community of believers stand beside them and say, well done. You've been a man and a woman of integrity. You've loved each other well. You've loved the community of believers well. You've fallen more in love with Jesus every day. And you are one of those you're one of those couples that we want to be around because there's so much fruit from your life. And now, you know, in this season, where we can come alongside of them and celebrate what God has done and, and say in the chorus of the saints, well done. We have been loved. Without a doubt, we have been loved. And because of that, I think we've been trusted and very grateful for that. God has been good 
and allowing us to help and encourage other people, which is where life finds its meaning. And Jesus said, I didn't come to be served, I came to serve and give my life a ransom for others. We don't have to give our life a ransom. He did that. <laughs> but we do invest our lives in serving others. And we're His representatives, reaching out to both those who are fellow brothers and sisters and those who don't know Christ. Nothing more important than giving our lives away to others.